super excited uh, to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Ani Kokobobo of the University of Kansas. And Ani will speak to us on Christ, Hadri Murat, and the late Tolstoy's non hegemonic masculinities. Uh, and Ani's um, subsidiary will be Julie Buckler of uh, Harvard University. Uh, Ani, please. Thank you, Idea. Do I have my, am I unmuted? Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I know what a busy time of the semester this is, and thank you so much to the Jordan Center for organizing this. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. I have tried to present there in person multiple times. It never works out, but at least I'm, I'm happy to do it via Zoom. Um, so, you know, I'll be talking today about Tolstoy and masculinity, but I wanted to sort of introduce what I'll be talking about because it's part of a larger project. Um, it's part of a book that I've been, that is hopefully will be finished soon, um, like all of our books, but it's a book um, titled Russian, tentatively titled Russian Sage of Sex, Tolstoy Theorizes Gender and Intercourse, and, and it's a book that looks at Tolstoy's entire career, and this particular piece of it that I'm talking about today is the last chapter, so I want to sort of just give you a very, very brief overview just to kind of clarify the path that brings me here. Um, you know, I, I, the book itself is um, six chapters and it starts with, with, you know, the early diaries. It starts with Tolstoy's kind of dirty diaries, you know, and, and his struggle to, to integrate that element, to integrate eras into narrative very early on um, and, and do so productively rather than, you know, only write about women in the sort of elevated manner um, and, and, and the struggle that that brings and, and, and what being a writer means and ways in which eras has to figure into narrative um, for writers. And then, you know, I, I sort of see the early Tolstoy struggling with these questions and sort of being someone non-normative for that reason, you know, trying to integrate these concepts into his narratives. You know, we see him then in War and Peace, which I sort of think is very loosey-goosey in terms of gender. Um, and, and as a result, provides more potential for women, more potential for growth and development. And then, you know, later on, I think in Anna Karenina, we see things are much more normative and, and perhaps more violent as a result. You know, a big part of this project for me, what's inspired a lot of it is I read years ago, Andrea Dworkin's work on Tolstoy. Um, it's, it's the first chapter of her book, Intercourse. And, you know, she hates Tolstoy the man. And she begins raging on Tolstoy the man for quite a while. Then at some point she ends up talking about Tolstoy the author and you know, the ways in which he understands how heterosexuality can be violent to women. And that's something that is very important to Dworkin as a, as a feminist theorist. Um, and it's just so fascinating to see her essentially ground her kind of main work on the Kreutzer Sonata um, and the sort of violation of women that Tolstoy presents there and the ways in which Tolstoy demands a new world order on the basis of that violence that he sees in heterosexuality. And so then we see, you know, I think the later works um, and, and I'll be focusing on that today, but it's just interesting to see a new masculinity and new types of relationships emerge um, out of that, out of that distaste that Tolstoy developed for heterosexuality in his later years um, and his understanding of it anyway. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of my prelude. I won't be talking today a lot about the sort of new type of relationships as much. Um, though I can talk about it in Q&A if, if people want to. So I'll be focusing more on masculinity and masculinity in the late Tolstoy. Now masculinity is a huge topic, obviously throughout Tolstoy. And it's not something we've talked about enough. Um, but I'll try to focus on the later years because I think it's really interesting when, when you know, we see the author embracing pacifism, anarchy and abstinence. And like, what does that do to masculinity, right? So in stepping out of social institutions and heterosexuality, what does that do to gender roles? And I think for Tolstoy, this question becomes more complicated later in life over time as he begins to advocate his ideas about abstinence um, and then his religious philosophy. Um, and, and once you, again, once marriage is out, once institutions are out, once you have anarchy, what then? Uh, Michael Kaufman writes about masculinity, quote, in a world dominated by men, the world of men is by definition a world of power. The power is a structured part of the economies um, and systems of political and social organization. 
Um, it forms part of the core of religion, family, forms of play and intellectual life. On an individual le level, much of what we associate with masculinity hinges on a man's capacity to exercise power and control. Kaufman explains that this power is, of course, tainted and interwoven with overwhelming powerlessness that does not match the systemic oppression of women and others, obviously, but that in itself can result in pain and isolation of a different kind. Um, the violation of the self and holding power over others is, I think, an important component of Tolstoy's own understanding of masculinity in his later years. As Tolstoy argues in his theoretical writings, social institutions are upheld by violence and participation in them is fundamentally violent and coercive. Um, predating, I think, second wave feminists, he came to see sexuality as a form of violence directed at women in his later years, um, with men going along and corrupting themselves in the process. Um, due to the general perception of societal institutions in this way, his characters especially the more abundantly represented male characters in his later years, have lim limited paths and storylines um, to avoid domination of others. And, and even, even characters like Haji Burad, who we'll talk about today, um, who engage in violence, engage in violence that has broad, broader metaphysical implications. And I, and I focus on men and masculinity because, to quote Andrea Dworkin, Tolstoy's later perspective as androcentric and the extreme, um, with some exceptions, of course. Um, but on the whole, women are either sex objects or just mouthpieces in his later years, with some exceptions. Um, but they don't get a whole lot of develop, they don't, development. They don't get a whole lot of representation. You know, the titles alone, I think, reflect some of this. I mean, the death of Ivan Ilyich, Father Sergius, Haji Murad, Alyosha the Pot. You know, you see Tolstoy really engaging in this sort of narrative abstinence um, alongside the, the real life abstinence. Um, this new idea is, you know, so, I, so, you know, in this new reality then, um, you know, we see the author do a number of things that I want to talk about. One is his representation of hegemonic masculinity is really problematic. Um, but at the same time, we also see the articulation of a new, I think, minority masculinity. Um, and, and here, I, you know, since Ilya is here, I will say that I really, you know, he's also done some really interesting work pointing out that, you know, in Tolstoy's later works, the, the kind of this narrative space <laughs> shrinks increasingly. Um, and I would argue shrinks increasingly from male characters. Um, so, so what we see, so what I wanna, wanna argue about is, you know, one, the, the ways in which Tolstoy criticizes I think hegemonic masculinity are really interesting, and I want to talk about that. Um, but then the second thing is that the new minority masculinity that we see emerge. And so if in earlier works, and sort of you had typical Tolstoy and seekers like Andrei Balkonsky, Pierre Vizukov, Konstantin Levin, and you had them sort of, they're always misfits in a way, who struggle to occupy, I think, traditional societal roles. And we're always kind of seeking something else, something on the margins of society for their own mental growth and development. Um, <clears throat> A number of later characters begin to even more comfortably apply the, the outsider status. Um, and then I argue that despite you know, most of Tolstoy's, despite their differences, most of Tolstoy's later male characters seek lives outside the sexual economy and societal institutions. Um, and then the way that this is constructed is against the backdrop of hegemonic masculinity, which for Tolstoy, I think crystallize this really interestingly around Nicholas the first, who, you know, in his later years becomes a sort of like really hated, typical male, tyrannical character. Um, and I suggest that the late Tolstoy's conceptualization of masculinity moves beyond the sex, the power and sex driven hegemonic um, model. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about Nicholas. I'll, I'll talk theory. I'll start with theory a little bit. I'll talk about Nicholas. Um, as a kind of, you know, foil of sense. And then I'll, I'll talk about Jesus as an alternative. Um, and then I'll talk about a couple of fictional examples and after the ball and Haji Murad. And I don't know how much I'll be able to get to all of those things, but I will, I will try. We will try. Um, so, so let me start with hegemonic masculinities and how we define them. Um, you know, Charlotte Hooper, who, you know, is, has, outlines a lot of, in, in her Manly States and the book Manly States, 
you know, outlines a number of different models, um, which, and, and kind of seeking to capture the duality between the private and public components that we encounter in manifestations of masculinity. Um, and in all of these models, I would say the, the emphasis falls on men's significant institutional roles, their success in the world, either in the military or in the public sphere and in other industries. A dominant male role is there also in the, in the private sphere and in the family. Now, some, you know, some research on Russian masculinities would have Russian masculinities function very similarly, um, you know, adhering to some of the broader ideals that we, that we see in, in European masculinity. Um, but, you know, there are some differences as well. I've seen some research on, you know, masculinity among peasants and how that is different, which I think is irrelevant to Tolstoy, and I'll try to talk about that a little bit. But in general, if we talk about masculinity more globally, um, I would say the issue of dominance, which has been theorized about quite a bit, um, is really important. And, and here, I think an important theorist is Raywan Connell, um, who's focused much of her attention on defining the idea of hegemonic masculinity and addressing, again, extensively the notion of how it's defined against the identities of others. And I'll quote something that she's written, quote, hegemonic masculinity is always constructed in relation to various subordinated masculinities, as well as relation to as, as well as in relation to women. Um, and then again, the interplay between different forms of masculinity is an important part of how a patriarchal, patriarchal social order works. And, and so what this means is that we have this very kind of notion of the male sex role um, and, the, and the cultural ideas of hegemonic masculinity are very public, but they're ultimately constructed on these sort of like fantasy figures um, whose achievements aren't really attainable for the most part, um, probably why it's so exhausting to be a man. Um, the public face of hegemonic masculinity, writes Connell, um, is not necessarily what, what powerful men are, but what sustains their power, what large numbers of men are motivated to support. Um, and again, what supports men's power is institutionalized practices and strategies of dominance over men and over other women often, and certainly over trans non-binary you know, non -binary. Um, individuals. Um, these ideas have been echoed also by Halberstam in her book about female masculinity, where she argues that, quote, there's a naturalized relationship between maleness and power. There's so-called heroic and dominant masculinities that, again, depend on wealth, they depend on institutional cloud, and, and more than anything, the subordination of alternative masculinities. And in, in Halberstam's book, that is, you know, female masculinity is a sort of alternative masculinity. Um, you know, so and 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 a more concrete, I think, understanding of hegemonic masculinity as reflected in day to day life, and institutions and systems, and in man's bodies is something that we would call a social embodiment, that of masculinity that reinforces, I think, hegemony. Um, you have male bodies functioning a certain way in, in sports and other arenas, and generally men expected to function in the work workplace and society through sort of you know, success and, and, you know, a certain kind of dominant, um, confident behavior. And again, these are all fantasy models. Um, and, and then, you know, you, if you think about this as a kind of general theoretical construct, we think about Tolstoy and then his later works, you know, we have Ivan Ilyich, we have Alyosha Gershok, Father Sergius, uh, Vita, you know, the, the Vasily, the master, Nick Ludov. This is an extensive catalog, I would argue, of alternative masculinities, or at least normative masculinities, aspiring to become alternative masculinities. Um, there's a number of officials, you know, these are officials turned into vulnerable individuals on their deathbed. You know, soft-spoken outsiders who think about marriage, but ultimately die before they have a chance. Um, you know, you have renegades, you have disenchanted gentry trying to find a path outside of the system. And, and many, many other, I think, non-traditional masculinities without particular vested interest in domination of others. The social embodiment of masculinity had been something that I think Tolstoy had always been skeptical toward. If we think about the Comil Foa ideal of gentry masculinity early on um, and the sort of social, one's social space, social engagement and success. These are things that Tolstoy had always been uncomfortable about and objected to. You know, think about Levin going to visit Oblonsky. Um, you know, first he's a complete alien, but then he sort of judges the, 
the hands and the long nails of the gentleman working in Oblonsky's office. Because again, they show that they, it shows that they never use their hands for manual labor, which I think is a cornerstone of Levin's own life and masculinity, um, which I think is an interesting distinction um, you know, to the social embodiment of masculinity. Tolstoy had, had conventionally seen, I think, a more authentic masculinity emerge in nature and in manual labor, um, which I think is a sort of Rousseauian early masculinity that is, that is far stronger and rooted in individual labor um, rather than dominance of others. It's a kind of craftsmanship of sorts. If you want to think about it like that, it's not, you know, it's not about being a, a social insider um, or socially appropriate or, or socially dominant for that matter. You know, Tolstoy is always uncomfortable in institutions from the very beginning. I mean, from his own career, if you will. Um, and the kind of gentry masculinity I think that the author conceived in his early works becomes even more transformed over time. So if natural strength was part of how Tolstoy understood masculinity, then this kind of physical strength is translated into ascetic masculinity in Tolstoy's later years when strength is directed at fearless mortification of the flesh, I would say, often, um, in the form of destruction of physical life and confrontation with death. And we see a lot of that in Haji Murat, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's, it's this kind of courageous embrace of death as inherently individual and insulated, um, which I think opens up a path towards spiritual freedom from the burdens of the ego. And we see masculine strength in Tolstoy appear that way. And also, again, and now I'll talk about also withdrawal from society, withdrawal from institutions, um, non-participation. You know, and, and you can see the challenge of constructing masculinity with all of the you know, Tolstoyan trappings of, you know, constructing masculinity and its trappings in the sort of Tolstoyan space, um, given that Tolstoy is saying no to, you know, sex and society and all institutions. Um, you know, but I think in a way we can also see this as great potential for what Tolstoy is able to create in his later years, um, which I think can be really interesting to look at. You know, as these new masculinities, I think even within that space, these new masculinities tend to emerge against a kind of very limited shell of hegemonic masculinity that I think is very interestingly built around um, Nicholas the First, um, you know, the, the gendarme of, of Europe. Um, and, and Tolstoy became very interested in Nicholas in his later years, um, writing about him in his diary multiple times around 1903, 1904, um, saying he was actively reading about the former emperor. Um, I thought today about Nicholas I, he writes in 1904 in his diary about his ignorance and self-assurance and about what a terrible thing it is that people of inferior, inferior spiritual strength can influence and even control people of superior strength. Um, and so you can kind of see already built in that statement to like two different models of, of masculinity and strength emerge, right? Um, and, and, and again, hinging on this idea of control. And this statement, I think, exudes Tolstoy's own distaste for Nicholas and his view of him as a pernicious figure who sought to dominate others. Nicholas appears in a similar light um, as an inferior embodiment of hegemonic masculinity in Tolstoy's other writings when he seeks again and again to control others. Um, we see him in Father Sergius, we see him in Haji Murad, and there's also a, a short sketch called Nicholas the Stick. Um, you know, in Father Sergius, he appears as this kind of lecherous, disgusting man who's trying to have an affair with Father Sergius' fiance. Um, and he doesn't, no one's like, the woman isn't particularly attracted to him, or we don't know, but no, you know, he has total control over these women he has affairs with, and then he expects the men to marry them, um, you know, to, to again, take care of the problem. So you have this, this morally bankrupt older man who uses the trappings of the crown to seduce younger women and exploit their vulnerabilities and exploit the vulnerabilities of younger men. Um, and it's just really interesting to see him to see how Tolstoy depicts him in Haji Murad, he appears as this kind of grotesque looking figure with a kind of protruding belly, a wig, covering his bald patch, these kind of lifeless eyes. Um, and again, he's dominant, but not because he's attractive, but because of his political and institutional role. And I think, again, Tolstoy uses his own sense of what true masculinity looks like and something akin perhaps to the peasant working in the fields um, with no real institutional clout. Um, and, and uses that to really discredit the, the purported hegemonic masculinity of Nicholas. You know, he is 
you know, the status and the lechery that he embodies that Tolstoy is kind of done with. That's a path that Tolstoy will not engage with in his narratives in his later years. Um, you know, in, in a sketch told from the perspective of an older soldier in Nicholas the Stick, you know, we see a discussion of Nicholas's Russia. Um, how was it then, says the soldier, well, they did not even take off the, the breaches for 50 rods, 150, 200, 300. They used to beat men, men to death. Um, so there's a sense of like the violence. Um, and, you know, the, the older man also says not a week passed by that a man or two um, were not beaten with sticks. Nowadays, we don't know what the stick is. But back then, that's all that we talked about. Sticks, sticks. You know, Tolstoy then continues to show Nicholas again in, in the novella Haji Murat, where again, he's deeply problematic, um, sends a man, sends a Polish student to, to run the gauntlet a thousand, you know, of a thousand men 12 times for stabbing a teacher and ca causing minor flesh wounds. I mean, that is a known death sentence. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting because in Haji Murat, also Tolstoy, it takes this more broadly because it's a Polish student, right? And so you see that not only is he literally dominating this other man, but from that you can kind of extrapolate this broader sort of hegemonic nationalist violence um, and, and, you know, imperial, Russian imperial activity. Um, you know, you have this Polish student, but then you have, you know, and, and you know, Nicholas erasing masculinities, but then you have the ways in which Nicholas says, um, you know, government um, and the Russian Empire is dominating the Caucasus and, and, and certainly Poland. But, you know, you, you see those, that broader signification of all of that as well. And I'm not, you know, I'm just trying to kind of get, the, get through. So I'm not getting too in depth right now, um, but we can talk about all that more because you see what that does then to the smaller nationalities that, you know, are being oppressed and the kind of hatred that rises in their, in their mentalities. Um, you know, and, and so, so, you know, that is a kind of, I think, broad sense of, of hegemonic masculinity. You know, there are other examples of it, obviously, but I think a lot of it clusters around Nicholas. Um, and, it, and it's really interesting um, to see other identities, right, develop. So, you know, other masculinities develop. So if, if Nicholas is a sort of epitome of hegemonic masculinities, um, you know, and, and normally this kind of masculinity would be allowed to minimize and erase other masculinities in Tolstoy's later works, they do emerge and they function, I think, as the antithesis of, of this hegemonic masculinity, they grow out of it. Um, you know, so male characters end up withdrawing from the worlds they inhabit, the kind of worlds that, that, that people like Nicholas, you know, dominate. So in Father Sergius, you know, after a confrontation with Nicholas, Sergius ends up withdrawing from the social realm. Um, he engages in this journey of social and institutional disavowal that he occupies much of the novella. I mean, that's his path. That's his objective. How to, how, you know, how to occupy less and less and less social space. Um, you know, even amongst even amongst corner ultimately ends up being too, too institutionalized, too social, um, too much, too ego driven. Um, like Father Sergius, you know, we have Nekludov in Resurrection similarly, you know, eventually deciding that he has to devote his life to righteousness in the kingdom of God um, at the end of the novel. A perfectly new life dawned that night for him, um, not because he had entered a new condition in life, but because everything he did after that night had a new and quite different meaning for him. Um, and, but, you know, of course, Tolstoy doesn't really know what this looks like, um, but, you know, you kind of this openness of, of a path for Nikhludov at the end of Resurrection and similarly in Master and Man, um, you know, rather than, again, rather than the master seeking to dominate Nikita and exploit Nikita as it had been for much of the, much of the novella, at the end you see a kind of re, reorientation of their relationship. The master sacrifice himself, sacrifices himself for Nikita. Um, and, and, you know, as we think about all of these alternatives, like another 
and, and I've been trying to organize this around historical figures because I think it's interesting. Tolstoy's engagement with them is interesting in his later years. But, you know, uh, the, the kind of historical alternative to Nicholas, the antithesis of Nicholas, is Jesus. Um, and Tolstoy is very interested in Jesus, of course, in his later years. Um, and, you know, as we think about iterations of minor masculinity, you know, I think one of the more prominent places that he talks about this is, is his translation of the New Testament Gospels um, that allow articulate how he himself understands the figure of Jesus. Um, and, and, you know, in this text, which is technically a translation, but it's really Tolstoy doing whatever he wants with it, um, translating however he wants. Um, he called it the best manifestation of my thought. Um, it is that one book that a person, as they say, writes his whole life. Um, and, and, you know, when it came to Jesus, Tolstoy wanted to really bring out a very human figure, um, beginning from childhood into adulthood. So, and, and he writes, the story of, of Christ's real life had for its foundation actual life full of depth and holiness. And so instead of the, oh, I'm deception and all that, you have intrigue and, you know, sex scandals. There was a young girl by the name of Mary. This young girl was bearing the child of an unknown person. The man betrothed to her felt pity for her and hiding her disgrace, he accepted her. Through her and the unknown father was born a boy. Um, and there's a summary of the divine conception, immaculate conception for you. Um, but, you know, in this, as this, you know, interpretation, I think, suggests, Tolstoy begins to read the story of Jesus as a very kind of human story, which is interesting because what it means is that, you know, you have marriage and sexuality out of the picture. Um, and then you have Tolstoy stage a kind of struggle for Jesus in the construction of his masculine identity. So you have him really kind of struggling with, um, you know, you have the temptation in the wilderness where he's a wane, you know, do I live a worldly life? And again, it's not the devil anymore because Tolstoy doesn't really believe in the miracles and he reads it in more abstract ways, but he shows Jesus as kind of weighing a worldly life of society versus a life devoted to God. Um, and then, you know, Tolstoy kind of articulates the sources of his temptation as, you know, the voice of the body, again, this very, very abstract, um, and, and, and sees it as a kind of com like common expression of an inner struggle, which is repeated in the soul of every man um, between two diametrically opposed principles of life, asceticism and materialism. Um, and of course, you know, Jesus chooses the former um, because he understands that you don't live by bread alone. And so, you know, he's unwilling to cast off the body in that temptation, that's the second temptation. Um, but that said, he still becomes a sort of consummate ascetic figure who really rejects the offerings of the world and a career as a man of the world. Um, and to quote Tolstoy, human beings, uh, because of their spiritual ties to God, are expected, just like children, quote, to not have faith in worldly institutions, uh, which is genia, which give birth to evil, antagonism, fornication, um, promises, judgments, violence, and war. Um, and so in the story of Jesus, you have this kind of radical, I think, redefining of masculinity through absolute withdrawal from external influences. You know, rather than just leaving his environment and institution, Jesus is completely abandoning them in order to find spiritual freedom. He overcomes the temptation in the wilderness, and then gradually you see him reject personal ties. Um, and this is there in the text that Tolstoy inserts this meaning. You see him reject the family, careers, nation. And again, this is all for the sake of a higher brotherhood. But, he, you know, Tolstoy does really interesting kind of, he erases, I would say, a lot of the Judaic um, significances of the New Testament. Um, and, but, but doesn't just do it. I mean, he gets, rid of, he gets rid of the Old Testament, but doesn't just do it. He makes a point to sort of frame it as Jesus not, Jesus renouncing the sort of sense of, of Jewishness and nationalism um, that emerges from that. And, and you see him just preaching for the sort of broader universal brotherhood. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you have this path of, of, and again, it's not a fictional text, but, but a path that Tolstoy constructs through his translation um, of, of total radical social withdrawal, non-participation. Um, and then, you know, 
we see these withdrawals occur time and again throughout his later fiction. Some of the examples I've been mentioning are interesting, but they don't, you know, they tend to happen often at the end of a narrative, right? Because, the, you know, and, and, and they, we don't really see them. We see an ethos of non-participation of withdrawal, but we don't see it kind of mapped out as much. Um, so for this reason, I think after the ball is an interesting example um, because we really see they are a kind of very deliberate choice to not participate in society. And again, I think it's interesting because here we see Nicholas appear again as an embodiment, I mean, through the father figure as an embodiment. Um, there's been some research on that and, and um, some similarities, some physical similarities between the father and Nicholas. Nicholas's depictions in Tolstoy, it's also the time is such as, you know, that's during Nicholas's reign. Um, but it, it's just interesting to see this narrative that's set in the 1840s and which begins, I think, in high society and kind of in a sense gives birth to that earlier world of childhood, boyhood, and youth. Um, and it's interesting to see the story of a gentry man, Ivan Vasilievich, and to see how his life changes overnight. Um, <clears throat> he likes this younger woman, um, Vodinka, um, and, and the courtship is all very comme il faut. There's the gloves and all the, it's, you know, th there's some interesting work, I think also comparing that to the early trilogy um, and, and really showing those ties. And, and he's very smitten with this young woman um, and, and, you know, a typical Tolstoy in fashion also loves her father, um, like this, you know, the whole family is, is a point of attachment. Um, and, and I think, you know, but then eventually at some point, um, walks into this military scene, and, and it's a moment that really calls to mind Nicholas the Stick, I would say, because you have a colonel who forces men to beat someone um, for being a deserter. And, you know, Ivan Vasilievich notes that there were blows continually basically falling on this man. Um, and I think what's interesting about this moment is the ways in which it, it affects Ivan, um, and, and the transition of his life away from this kind of cycle of violence and abuse. I can never understand it then or afterwards, he says, um, um, and why he was so stunned, you know, by that moment. Um, and, and I was not able to grasp it. And not being able to grasp it, I could not enter the service as I had intended. I don't mean only the military service. I did not enter the civil service either. And so I have been of no use whatsoever, as you can see. Um, end quote. So confronted with this kind of violence of institutions, you have Yvonne really um, refused to engage. And also, you know, his love for Vadinka diminishes little by little um, and, and, and goes away. Um, you know, but again, you see this new masculinity, this new path um, and, and the ways in which it, it is perhaps born out of confrontation with hegemonic masculinity that is so much more problematic. Um, but that rather than stifling this other type of masculinity, hegemonic masculinity actually potentiates it, um, enables it in an indirect, unwilling way. Um, you know, and um, I'm going to try. And so, so let me then, you know, and, and you know, th these are also ideas that fit, I think, very interestingly with Tolstoy's later I think religious ideas, obviously. Um, you know, Tolstoy writes um, in, in some of his later writings, he says, freedom, um, you know, identity and masculinity are defined and should be defined as freedom from earthly, author earthly authority. Um, and so he writes, freedom not imaginary but actual is attained not by barricades or murders, not by any kind of new institution coercively introduced, but only by the cessation of obedience to any human authority whatsoever. Um, and he doesn't explain these, but I think, you know, um, I think that under his understanding of masculinity becomes very synonymous with this, you know, refusal of all authority, all outside of Torah. And it's a kind of tremendous power. Um, and it is a kind of power that is very much, I think, spiritually founded, founded on that sort of divine sources of the spirit that he came to define in his later years. Um, but it allows individuals to not succumb to the pressures put forth by dominant figures like Nicholas the um, first. <clears throat> and so that brings me to Haji Murad, who I want to try to talk about really briefly. 
um, and what little time I have, which may not be a ton. Um, you know, Haji Murad is a very weird novella, um, and I'm, I'm really interested in it. I've written about it, and I just find it really fascinating um, because he's very different, right? He's a sort of red-blooded macho figure, and Hugh McLean has written really interestingly, um, contrasting, I think, Christ and Haji Murad and saying, you know, one is really red-blooded and macho and, and you know, irreproachably, you know, whereas Jesus is not irreproach irreproachably masculine. Um, and, and, you know, it's just interesting to see that Jesus perhaps is someone who runs against the grain of the ideals of masculinity, traditional ideals of masculinity. Um, and, and, you know, Hugh McLean's argument is that by contrast, you know, Tolstoy felt more comfortable with Haji Murad, who was more traditionally masculine. And, and I think, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that Haji Murad was ever traditionally masculine. I think in many ways, um, while Haji Murad embodies the physical masculinity that we see Tolstoy kind of construct at times, um, he also is very much in a path of withdrawal from, I think, the standards, the kind of earthly centers of power, if you will. He detaches himself from Shamil, um, and then over time he detaches himself, himself from the Russians as well. Um, and I've argued elsewhere that he engages in this sort of through the violence that he carries out in the novella, he engages in this sort of spiritual Sufi path of self-purification, um, which I kind of see as a destruction of the ego, as, as asceticism, violence against the self, um, and a kind of fearlessness at the face of death, um, which I think, you know, and, and over time, you know, you see him give up layers and layers and layers of his identity, eventually only caring about his family and eventually not even caring about them. You know, in his dying moments, he's just thinking about the beyond. Um, so, you know, this, this withdrawal is, I think, very interesting. And, and it may be circumstantial for Murad, but I think this is a strategy that Tolstoy engages in a lot, where he finds male characters in moments where they're not engaged in the structures of power. Right? Unless they are Ivan, and unless they willingly make a choice, Tolstoy just finds them in these moments where they're outside and, and sees their development and either like enables that to, to proceed further or just ends um, with, with kind of pointing out that, that tremendous potential. Um, and so, you know, and again, and, and during the last scene um, of Haji Murad's death, the sort of, you have this macho hero, but he is very much the antithesis of Nicholas um, in the novella. And he's a very, he's perceived as a very strong fighter and he has very close relationships with his men and, and, and is supportive and non-dominant of them. Um, but you see that even the violence that he engages in at the end is, is less direct. It just seems like he's firing into the abyss um, and, and Tolstoy more keeps track of the of the wounds and the bullets that he's absorbing and the ways in which he continues to fight despite absorbing them, um, which I think is interesting. And um, I think I may be over time slightly, but uh, let me just quickly wrap up. You know, this all for me is, is really interesting. And I kind of inevitably um, think about how all of it fits with Tolstoy himself, um, you know, his own journey the, the kind of thinking that he's doing and engaging in about his own masculinity, his own profound discomfort with being a gentry landowner man and all the ways in which he's, you know, trying to reorient his own life away from the sort of heterosexual um, life of the state toward a kind of different um, non-hierarchical ties with his quote unquote disciples. And then eventually his, you know, renunciation of property, copyright, all the things. Um, but then seeking to really leave that space completely to withdraw to to you know leave his wife you know, unable to disentangle himself until he finally just leaves <laughs> um and then dies um but anyway so that all kind of i'm trying to to think about through all these models in the fiction into sort of the biographical context itself too and i'll just stop there so i don't I don't know if now maybe Julie would talk or we. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ani, so much. This was uh, really fascinating. And uh, yeah, Julie, please, your response. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you so much to the Jordan Center and to the organizers of 19V, which, is, which would be very welcome even if there weren't a pandemic. And thank you very much to Ani for her very refreshing and thought-provoking paper turning some of the Tolstoy conversations in a new direction.
Um, I just want, I want to say that it's, it's hard to say new things about Tolstoy. Uh, he had such a long creative life with all those shifts. There's so much writing about him. His characters are so iconic. So um, it's a challenge to, to say something new. And I really appreciate Ani's work. So I have two things to say, and I'll say them quickly because I'm sure um, others have questions. The first thing is about Haji Murad and Harold Bloom. And the second one is about Pierre Bizukhov. So about Haji Murat, um, Ani referred to Hugh McLean's work, um, referring to Haji Murat as a red-blooded hero. And the paper, uh, Ani's paper that I read, also quotes Bloom, uh, calling Haji Murat elemental like a pure flame. But I wanted to take us back to that passage in the, his Bloom's book, The Western Canon, um, because his description of Haji Murat is so focused on masculinity. So it's just a few sentences long and I'll read it. Of all natural men of heroic eminence in Western literature, Haji Murat is the most impressive. He dies in battle knowing he must because he has no alternative, but he dies without Achilles rage against mortality or Hector's collapse into passivity. He can die with absolute dignity because he knows that he is not only the best of the Tatars, but superior also in horsemanship, daring, fighting skill, and charismatic leadership to any of the Russians." Unquote. So my question to Ani is, can we reconcile her fresh reading with this very influential traditional view of Haji Murat, perhaps through the spiritual elements that Ani focuses on? So that's my first question. And then the second one, looking at Tolstoy's earlier work for examples of non-traditional masculinities, and I found myself uh, thinking about Pierre Vizuchov. Ani's paper um, names seeker characters like Pierre and Andrei Balkonsky and Levin um, who, who eschew institutional affiliations um, for larger spiritual searches. And um, in particular, a character like Levin we think about his muscles that everyone always seems to be squeezing in the novel. And yes, uh, Pierre is a bear and he's large and strong and has a violent temper and strong sexual and other appetites. But in other ways, um, and, and I think this is reflected in the scholarship, although I didn't have time to search closely, uh, Pierre is kind of Christ-like in various places, kind of meek and accepting and humbly enduring, um, particularly when he's a prisoner of war. But but in earlier sections of the novel as well. Um, and um, I think about moments like him um, sort of bearing his chest at the duel and the Freemason ceremony in this strangely receptive way to the bullets or the swords of others, or, um, or even funky moments like um, his sexual dreams in his diary about spiritual fulfillment. Um, his feeling at the engagement party that he's as beautiful as Hélène um, his outfit at the Battle of Borodino, the green tailcoat and white hat. So there is no kind of Pierre-like character with these qualities in Anna Karenina. And I'd be curious to know Ani's thoughts about the extent to which Pierre might be an early inconsistent example of this kind of later Tolstoy non-hegemonic or minority male protagonist, or maybe it's something else. When Ani began today, she mentioned Tolstoy's loosey-goosey ways of representing gender in War and Peace. And so maybe some of these aspects of Pierre are an undeveloped version of an alternative masculinity rather than um, this non-hegemonic ma masculinity that, that, that Ani is exploring. So, um, so thank you very much for the talk. And uh, that's, those are my comments. Um, thank you so much, Julie. Those are really interesting comments. Um, I guess, should I just respond right now? Is that okay? okay. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I think the, I have really mixed feelings about the Harold Bloom piece about Haji Murat, right? But at the same time, I mean, he's right and he's not right. Like, he's right in some ways, right? Because I think that is partly what is so compelling about Haji Murad, that, that he is so strong and so masculine. And then I think, you know, it's interesting. I sort of, as, I, as you were reading that quote, I was thinking, you know, very deeply about, you know, is he, you know, to some extent, is Tolstoy also trying to craft a type of masculinity that is satisfying, but that is non-dominant, that is abusive, that doesn't ultimately rely on, on putting down others. Um, 
you know, which I think he is in part, but and not that he's doing any one thing, right? He's doing multiple things, but I think he is also doing that a little bit. Um, and I don't know that he would like openly write about that <laughs> either. Um, but I also, and, and maybe this will lead me to the, the next thing a little bit too, but I think it's also interesting to think about how, you know, human identity is then defined in very spiritual terms. And the spirit is not engendered, right? Razumina um, is non-gendered, is neuter. You know, Levin's baby in Anna Karenina is born as Anol, whereas in War and Peace earlier it was On. Now it's Anol, like it's this very like, you know, it's this very like, it's non-gendered. And I think as, as so Tolstoy starts to leave, excuse me, the body behind, you know, the spirit is non-gendered. You know, he's in a way trying to move away completely, I think, from gendered. Um, and to the extent that you can do that in literature and still write within a certain style, it, it's not always possible, but I think he does do that. And, and, and I think the ways in which War and Peace um, is loose in terms of gender are extremely fascinating because I think very early on in that novel, you know, Tolstoy is still trying to figure it out, but he breaks the world, he breaks society, that Napoleonic, um, you know, invasion disrupts everything and, and in a way that is destructive and horrible and violent, but it's also in some ways creates potentials for under, you know, for individuals that aren't necessarily comfortable within social bounds, like women, like Natasha, um, Maria, like they get to travel, they're, you know, they're not just sitting there waiting to be proposed to, you know, dressing their pretty, you know, dressing their pretty clothes. Um, they, they get to travel. I mean, Natasha goes and finds Andre and, and helps him die and, and does all these things and, and finds her own redemption in the world in a way that I think only men you know, are able to do in the traditional buildings where I'm on. So, so she gets to really use the world as a kind of educational space. And, and I think, you know, the Napoleonic invasion is part of that because the two, the, the war and peace are, are so interestingly, you know, fused. And then of course, you know, figures like Platon Karatev are so fascinating. And, and again, we see Tolstoy playing with this. And I think there's a lot of negative commentary about the performance of gender in society. Um, so I think at that point he, you know, there are very interesting parallels at that point because he still hasn't quite determined that this is the way it is. And I think in Anna Karenina, this is the way marriage is and it's not going to change, you know, in some ways. Like as much as you might have negative thoughts, like it becomes very sort of normative and, and Tolstoy focuses on the sort of negative opinions that he has about the kind of normative, you know, it's that end of war and peace with Natasha and the marriage, marital scene, and, and that feels very negative. Um, and I think by then he's already like done with the experimentation in some ways. Um, but I, but I, I think Pierre is very interesting and, and I have talked with some colleagues who are on this call right now about Pierre and Andre Volkonsky and, and Tolstoy's different male characters. Um, and I really like Pierre. I think he's an outsider in, in some really, really interesting ways. And I really appreciate your comment. And I think there is something Christ-like and ascetic about Pierre and the willingness to sort of, to just accept this kind of asceticism. And, and I think I, we see that same thing in Haji Murat. Um, and I think that that description at the end where he's literally, he dies um, and, and it's just about how long will they be able to withstand the bullets? It's not about how many other people they'll kill, because I mean, they're obviously doing that too. But Tolstoy's depiction doesn't focus on that as much. It's just about, and, and Haji Murad took this other, you know, and it's about the sort of mortification of the flesh that I think is there for Pierre. Um, and I think it's an interesting part of his spiritual journey, um, you know, where he, you know, loses all the weight and becomes the sort of, you know, goes through this journey with the prisoners and, um, so anyway, I don't I don't know if that answered some of what you're okay. Okay, cool. So, so I've opened up the chat. Uh, if people want to start submitting questions, but Ilya, if you want to ask the first question, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I, I I can I can go first. Uh, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Annie and, and Julie. Uh, uh, this was super thought-provoking and um, uh, I guess just a kind of quick question uh, hopefully uh, that I have for Ani was as, as, as you were talking in this way this very suggestive way about masculinity uh, and the opposition between the hegemonic uh, 
and, and the non-hegemonic or minor masculinity, uh, I started, uh, my mind kind of started going uh, a little wild and I started sort of thinking about mm, whether or not it, it, it's possible to think of, of, a, of, a, of multiple masculinities uh, rather than, rather than mm -hmm. in terms of this opposition, right? And, and um, in this, you know, and so I was, I was wondering if you've had thoughts about, um, about that question, about how you would go about talking about multiple masculinities. But also, I, was, I started thinking about all of these other minor masculine figures in non-Tolstoy, right? So like Prince Mishkin, uh, right? Or, or Alyosha Karamazov, or Oblomov, uh, right? These, these people who are, who are sort of, uh, who are sort of, who kind of meet um, your standard of, of minor masculinity in, in some respects. Um, and I, I guess a kind of slight addendum to this question would be um, when, when, you know, I, I really found uh, very interesting and, and kind of productive, productive convincing the association between masculinity and social standing or kind of social embedding. embedding. Um, but then, of course, one thinks, right? And live in uh, live in Steva opposition seems like a very nice one in this regard, uh, right? When you start asking which one's more masculine, uh, it becomes really confusing, right? Because certainly Steva is uh, expresses his masculinity in in ways that are very traditional while being embedded, uh, and Levin is doing it also in very traditional ways. Uh, it seems um, while while being socially disembedded. Um, so, uh, yeah, so some of these questions, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts, they're kind of open-ended. No, I think this is really interesting and I really appreciate you raising that. I mean, I, I sort of was thinking as you were mentioning Mishkan and all these other characters, and like, I, I really think we might be hard pressed to find any very like traditionally masculine figures in Russian literature, right? I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't know who they are, right? They're sort of very- um, Bazarov. I was gonna say Bazarov, but then, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. But but you know, I don't know, and I I, I do think so that. Or the worst of them all, Stolz. <laughs> the worst of the worst. Um, the man's it, planar par excellence. It's really interesting, right? I don't know. I mean, I think I think um, I do think that it is. I think it is productive to think about it in terms of multiple masculinities and to see Tolstoy kind of groping at this problem and really seeking um, different models. Because I also then think like for the gentry, right? You know, part of the whole gentry experiment is you don't have to be in society because you have your own little microcosm that you constructed, you're God of. Um, and there you have all the power. Um, and Tolstoy really likes that. And it is, is very physical, you know, working the fields with the peasants, you know, you're, you're already like in this dominant position um, that doesn't require that you dominate anyone actively. Um, so it's interesting. And I think Tolstoy is experimenting with that, but I don't know that that, that is hegemonic in the same way. And I think, um, I haven't seen a ton of, of, of um, I, I would love to see more sort of like general 19th century Russian masculinity type research. Um, haven't seen a ton of it. Um, I would love to hear if others have seen more. I've, I've been kind of poking around um, a lot lately and trying to, you know, some stuff is really quite dated. Um, but, um, but yeah, and then, then, you know, then the peasant masculinity, right? On the one hand, the peasants are very strong physically, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, they're very different. Their masculinity is very different. Like, it appears that in some ways that kind of masculinity is something that Tolstoy is aspiring towards too, that sort of pilgrim masculinity. Um, oh, and Connor is working on Russian literature and masculinity. I think he is. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, I think that, that it's really interesting and I, I definitely like the way that you're phrasing it about the kind of different as opposed to one versus the other, because I think even as I was saying, like the, it's not really binary because in many ways, the confrontation with hegemonic masculinity then forces someone to adopt a different masculinity to, to, to you know, to go a different route because of that confrontation with violence. They choose a different path. Um, so, yeah, so yes. Um, and I think someone has a question. 
Shama Shahadat, if you'd like to ask your question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was very uh, interesting and intriguing. And I have a kind of follow-up question to, to Ilya because I also, also thought that masculinities, wouldn't one have to look at them from a, an intersectional point of view, which means like so not only social status, but also nationality or health, for example, because Mishkin is, um, well, he's not, he, he's, he has an illness. And um, other aspects, that's the one thing, and I was wondering whether Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, who are so often looked at as being antipodes um, in Russian realism, maybe they are more similar than we think if we look at, at, the, at Dostoevsky's unhegemonic uh, male figures and Tolstoy's late male figures. And maybe the difference is that um, in Tolstoy they have to overcome their maleness first, while in Dostoevsky they often don't have it, like Alyosha in Bratya Karamazove or Mushkin, for example. Yeah, I mean, I also I mean, think I also think I it's really think interesting. Um, Dostoevsky. I don't know why I'm hearing myself. Um, I just think Dostoevsky has. Some, there's some really interesting stuff in Dostoevsky about disability um, <clears throat> and illness, um, and I think disability and, and women. Um, and, and then men and disability. And um, I think those are really interesting questions that, um, that are quite a little bit different than I think how Tolstoy is, is thinking about it. Um, but I, I, do think that the, I do think that they both are sort of wrestling with that idea um, and, and, and what it means and, and, and the difficulties of, of, of assuming a, a, a social male role. Um, and, and I think, you know, Tolstoy is wrestling with that for himself. And I just, I always, whenever I teach my Tolstoy seminar, I start with kind of his rather complicated path to a career um, and how he just can't fit and, and, and the ways in which he can't fit in the military and the ways in which he, you know, um, and until finally he becomes, a, you know, in his education and then his challenges as a university student until eventually you see him become a writer. It was basically writing about his, his own life and his lost mother. You know, I mean, that's his debut. And, and it's, an, it's a career, but it is a very interesting career and it's very individual based and it's not like a, a you know, he's not a person that fits. I mean, you know, Gustafson, resident stranger. I mean, he's a stranger. He doesn't fit. There's a way, there are all these ways in which he doesn't fit, which I think are problematic from a masculine perspective. But at the same time, he's also, you know, I, I don't know that someone like Platon Karatayev is the only kind of masculinity that Tolstoy is comfortable with, right? You know, I think he really also needs Hajimura. Like that there is this kind of strength. There is masculine strength that I think is really important to him but that I think has to not come at the expense of dominating others. Um, and then I think, you know, um, there may be sort of social models that that fits, but, um, but I think it's, it's just interesting um, to sort of see him through. And I think he's still thinking about it in Hajimura. Like he's still like, maybe I figured it out. Maybe this is what, maybe this is how we do it. Maybe this is how I reconcile all of the pieces, the anarchist piece, the non-participation in society, all the, the non-sexual, all of that, but strength and strength to sort of take the blows to, you know, um, it's like Grisha, you know, very early on in childhood, who's like beating himself for God. Um, and Hanji Murad is willing to embrace death. He's not afraid. I think that that's really important that I think confrontation with death is very important throughout Tolstoy, but I think remains as, as a kind of token for masculinity. Um, I think uh, Emily has a, uh, dealing with, it's a really interesting comment about, you know, uh, dealing with questions of what it means to be human um, and, 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 you know, what it means to be a man. Um, but it's not a question per se. So I will move on to Chloe Kissinger. Or, and, Sorry, and I was going to say Christine, from Christine first. Yeah, Christine oh, Rowan, if you'd I like to. I'm, I apologize. Sorry. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Uh, so thank you for a, a very interesting talk about a very interesting man. Um, and because I'm a historian, I'm going to sort of blur things a little bit, I think. But um, I think it's important to remember that despite Tolstoy's very positive views of peasants, 
that peasant men in their relationships with their wives also had hegemony. And, you know, we're still sorting out to what extent it was, um, ex um, it was common, but certainly among everything I've read, it was very common. And so it's a way in which his figure of Nicholas is in fact seen among the peasantry themselves. And that is, I think, part of what he's trying to work on, right? The way in which masculine hegemony is hegemonic in the sense that everybody is, in, is in, uh, complicit in this, that, that men do exercise whatever power they happen to have at whatever social level they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one thought that I had. The second one was, so when he's talking about Nicholas I, Nicholas I was a real person. And so to what extent is his image of Nicholas accurate? How much could he know about the former Tsar? And uh, how much of it is his own imaginings of this man? And how, as you point out, he becomes a kind of foil, but um, that sort of drifts into his own, his own representation of him, which is different from the historical or what we know about who he was as a person, what the documents, historical documents, whether they would confirm that or not. It's not really a question, but it's a comment. And then finally, um, the one thing that has always bothered me about Tolstoy, and I haven't read everything that he's written, but enough, and it seems to me that he wants his ideas to be hegemonic. And so what does that say about his version of masculinity? Is he just simply replacing one with another? I guess I'll stop there. Um, I think the piece about the peasants, I think is very, you know, appropriate and accurate. And I, you know, I think that also takes us to the very complicated relationship that, you know, writers like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky had with the peasants. And then, you know, you have someone like Chekhov who writes about peasants very differently and I think embodies the sort of potential for violence and abusive, you know, relations um, in that little peasant microcosm that, you know, tends to be far more purified and, and whitewashed and idealized um, in, you know, in other authors. Um, I think the point you're raising about Nicholas, the real Nicholas and Tolstoy's Nicholas is I think really interesting and I appreciate you raising that as a historian. Um, and I think it's something that I'm going to need to kind of go back and, and make more precise. Um, will require me kind of reading more into Nicholas himself. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting. I am not as informed as I would like to be about the historical Nicholas. I am informed about Tolstoy's Nicholas, which I think is undoubtedly quite different <laughs> from the real, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, Nicholas obviously had this, his, you know, reputation precedes him as this sort of, you know, tyrannical, um, you know. But he was know, also, of, according to Richard Wortman, the family man, right? The, the family Victorian man, yeah. Family man. That's interesting. And that's interesting. Yeah, I should look, oh, thank you for bringing up Richard Wortman, because I need to go, I should go look at that um, more carefully. But I think it's interesting because I, you know, family itself is very problematic for Tolstoy and, and violent. Um, so anyway, um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I also, I think in terms of Tolstoy pushing his own agenda, I mean, yes, of course. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's Gorky to the very end when he talks about Tolstoy and God says it's like two bears in a den, you know, they're, they're, Tolstoy's wrestling with God, he's fighting. <laughs> Um, I don't know that Tolstoy ever would just had like a non-complicated relationship with really anyone. So yes, I think he is um, working out his own masculinity challenges. I think there too. Um, I do think that he is very determined to non be to be non-dominant um, in his later years. I think he's working on that. You know, just like he's working on he's a work in progress. I mean, you know, it's always a, pro a process for him. You know, he's always working on trying to not engage in sexual activity. You know, um, and that's a process. And I think what was in his 80s or something that he wrote the diary entry of like I figured out the sex problem. I don't have a libido anymore, but I'm still working on my ego. So I mean, you know, we it's a I think it's always a process. Um, 
I, but that's what I like about the late Tolstoy that he's not, you know, as Irving Howe says, you know, he's just, he's not gracious. He doesn't age with, he doesn't age with, with grace. You know, he's still raging to the very end, which is kind of interesting. Um, I think. Um, Chloe Kitzinger, oh. if you want to ask your question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. And Annie, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I think this question sort of dovetails with Emily's comment about being masculine and, and being human um, in, in Russian literature. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the challenge that comes from within late Tolstoy himself to thinking in terms of categories of gender at a time when he's trying to think you know, not just beyond gender and sex, but also beyond the body, right? And beyond mortality. Um, obviously there are many blind spots there in the idea that you can think yourself beyond those categories. But it seems to me that Tolstoy would resist this idea that he's dealing with masculinity as such mm -hmm. at all, right? Um, so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about sort of why masculinity becomes the logical primary category um, um, in which to deal with, with Tolstoy. And yeah, then no, also, I don't. sorry, okay. um, okay. at the same time, why in, he also still seems to need this sort of other, right, which is sometimes the peasant, sometimes a woman, um, something that is not his, his particular intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, of of categories, whether that sort of continuing need for for an other also intersects with what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. No, I think I think it's a really interesting question. I think it goes a little bit to uh, some of what Julie was also talking about, and this idea of is it you know because yeah, of course you know he would love to remove the body, right? We're all just spiritual entities, right? And I think I think there are you know, I think both of those things are important. I think the disavowal of all personhood <laughs> in general, right? Not being, a, not being a self at all, just being this kind of communal spiritual entity, like the tree of life. He writes about the tree of life that we all just go back to. And then that's, and, and you know, his whole tension with his wife that he writes about in his diaries is about the fact that she is still living the life of the family with him as her husband. And he's living the life of, you know, some greater communal, spiritual communal identity, you know, that completely disavows all of these kind of more partial identities. So from that perspective, yes, I think, you know, Tolstoy would have us disavow all gender, all, you know, all particulars. Um, but at the same time, even within that kind of broader, you know, ideal picture, he's still wrestling with a more local question, I think, of masculinity and what it means to be a man. And, and he's writing the literature that he's writing sort of makes it very hard for him to write about these sort of broad spiritual identities, right? And I think in the, in the theoretical writings, he can afford like Path of Life, for instance, you know, Path of Life is contemporaneous with Haji Murad. They have a lot of interesting ideas that they share, but Haji Murad is this, this kind of very fleshed out narrative of actual people um, who are mortal, who do confront their mor mortality, and their sexualities and, and, and their, you know, gender identities. Um, so it's interesting. I think both problems are there. Um, but I do think that the more purist Tolstoy would say, I'm done with gender. Oh, that is yesterday's problem. Like, that's not, you know, I figured that out. But I think he does that at the same time as he, and he's still trying to kind of work at the problem um, and, and sort of, you know, addressing it. And I think, I also think you're raising a, an interesting point, which is, and it's something I just was thinking about as I was working on this too, is if he's not going to talk as much about women in his later years, because, you know, whatever, I don't want to deal with them at all. Um, I mean, he does, there's Maslava, and I think she is sort of unique, but she's depicted intentionally as unattractive. And um, then there's like the women sex objects, like the devil, um, or in Father Sergius, um, or there's like female mouthpieces for the author. And again, not necessarily development, but they're there. But are they there sort of in relation to the men? There is a woman in, in Haji Murad who's interesting. But I just think about the dynamics of the others and what they do and, and the need even in Master and Man to have Nikita there um, because it helps, it helps the master not engage in dominant behavior. You know, and, and without the possibility of dominating someone else, then 
well, then the temptation isn't there, right? I, you know, it's just, it's interesting. And I have to kind of puzzle through that more, but it, it's just, it's all sort of really interesting to think about. Um, and again, I, I think both are there, the, the erasing gender, but also wrestling with gender um, at the same time. Um, Nathaniel, I, I don't right? like to uh, um, unmute yourself. You can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Really, really interesting talk. I, <laughs> what if we go on a jet wagon onto the roof and then we dive into the pool? George, what is this? Um, so, anyhow, I, I, I particularly enjoyed your discussion of Nicholas the First. Um, and interesting. I mean, I, I think uh, Tolstoy uh, was a scrupulous historian, and he did rely on sources but he uses them. He, he creates these caricatures in wonderful ways to sort of suit his purposes without departing necessarily from, from the historical record. Uh, there's another historical figure in Haji Murat who's also really interesting and that's Shamil. Um, and he has a, a detailed portrait of Shamil and it's always struck me how there's kind of a parallel structure where you have Nicholas on one side and Shamil on the other side um, and then you know all the consequences of their actions but of course, Shamil has a direct relationship with Haji Murad, um, and uh, and in fact, the you know they fall out for reasons of jealousy, and that Haji Murad is basically a better warrior than Sh than Shamil, and uh, and so as a result, these push them out. And so I'm wondering, first of all, just to sort of comment on the portrayal of of Shamil, and you know, what do you think? You know, in creating this parallel structure. You know, what was Tolstoy sort of getting at with this? And does Haji Murat's relationship with, with Shamil complicate in any way this notion of him as a kind of alternative uh, masculinity? Or is it more the fact that, you know, Shamil was the one with the power and Haji Murat been in a situa similar situation, he may have been a similar type of person. Uh, the other thing that I, that I really love about Haji Murat is this image of the thistle. At the very at the very beginning, which becomes a kind of symbol of Haji Murad, and I'd be interested to your your comments of how this this thistle sort of embodies the notion of this kind of alternative masculinity that uh, Tolstoy is getting at. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question, and I think to add more, <laughs> I think to the question, of the Haji Murad himself you know, and, and who he was historically, right? I mean, and I don't know that the Tolstoy's portrayal of him is particularly accurate um, or that Tolstoy cares, you know. To, I mean, I think that, especially because over time, I think it grows and it evolves. And, you know, the novella, I mean, I think it's like 3,000, 2,000 manuscript pages where he is just like playing and kind of re... Um, I think, Shem, you know, again, I also like my sort of, I've read a bit about Shemiel, so I'm not gonna plead total ignorance, um, but I, I don't, you know, I think, again, as a literature scholar, I'm approaching this from the perspective of how Tolstoy sees it. And I think for Tolstoy, Shemiel and, and, and I think Valeria is saying something similar in the chat, but you know, Shemiel and Nicholas are these two poles of power. They have, they are the sort of hegemonic masculinities and they hold the power and they, they do very similar things where, you know, I think Shamil has like multiple wives and is like, you know, in some ways he's probably a little bit better than, um, than Nicholas, um, but you know, it's a low bar, but you know, I think, um, I think it, it you know, Shamil, uh, Haji Murad sort of renounces both. Um, and I think that's intentional. Um, and, and they are these parallels. I agree with Valeria. Um, but yeah, the history, I think Tolstoy is, is playing fast and loose with the history, but I mean, he did that in War and Peace. I think, you know, um, he does, yeah. So, but, but I, you know, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, and I, I just have to think, I think more about the sort of history and, and how Tolstoy is manipulating it. Um, and again, I come back to that question of, I want to think more about, you know, historical studies of masculinity in 19th century Russia, of which I don't. I think what actually he, I think Tolstoy actually writes his own source into his narrative, mm -hmm. because you have Laris Milikov, who is a, a, a real historical figure who was there in the Caucasus and actually did write the sort of standard historical account of Haji Murad based on his interviews with him. So, and, and that's almost certainly what Tolstoy used as a basis for the story. So it's a fascinating situation where you have, you know, in the fictionalized story, he actually writes the creation of the source of the historical material into the, 
into the story itself, which is mm -hmm. kind of cool. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you so much for your question. Um, Jenny Flaherty, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Thank you, Annie. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the, the question about, or well, the idea and some comments around it about the sort of tendency toward, you know, wanting to get away from domination. And then, you know, it, in, in your comments in response to Chloe, the sort of equal tendency uh, maybe, maybe throughout towards, you know, a kind of like disembodied um, rejection of the body absolute spirit, right? I mean, these seem to me like, that's the problem, right? The, the, the wanting both. And another way to put it, right, is like the, the old problem of independence and dependence, right? So, so, so to, to, to want for, um, you know, this sort of um, place of, of non-dependence on the body, on others, um, and at the same time avoid domination. And, you know, the problem is, is that like, well, how do you have those two things together? And so, so I'm wondering if sort of thinking about the problem in this way makes me think, well, yeah, I mean, how do gender roles map onto that? And, you know, it, and, and, and I'd be curious to see what you think that, you know, that then is really a question about in what way do we want to be dependent, right? Because the, the world of the family, which is, you know, being talked about in the comments, it seems to me sort of that like, when, when the sphere of sort of what you give of yourself to this sort of higher cause and therefore entangle yourselves in, in, in collectivities um, that, that render you very much dependent within and on them, you could do that in the family, you could do that, you know, in the sort of service um, state public sort of domain. Um, so, so it just seems to me interesting that these are sort of two modalities of being dependent, one in which is sort of like, you know, cast aside as this really problematic, weighty, like sort of weighing you down form, and one of which, which is sort of cognized equally as the sort of like giving up of oneself um, to something larger, um, you know, it, it is not. Um, so, um, so, so perhaps just sort of like going back to, you know, the, the sort of public, public private, but um, anyway, just sort of like how, how how to think about these two things as sort of essentially in conflict, um, you know, a, a movement away from domination and and um, mm -hmm. uh, and a need for dependence, um, and mm -hmm. and in what way? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point, and I think um, you know, I think over time it becomes about you know, violence at the, at the, you know, I think Tolstoy's sort of deep preoccupation, you know, the pacifist Tolstoy thinking about violence and its role um, in, 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 in between relations, right? Power dynamics, all of that, that's a form of violence. Um, and I think, you know, to go back to what Chloe was saying earlier too, you remove women, you remove the others, then you're just a, then it's just men. And then it's a kind of the, the society of men and how do they relate to each other? Um, and how do they, kind of, you know, what's, what does that dynamic look like? Um, and, you know, if, if the relationship between men and women is inherently problematic and in some ways violent, then is the relationship between men, could that be more horizontal? You know, could that just be more interdependence, perhaps, what you're suggesting? I mean, I think it's, an, it's a really interesting question. Um, and, and I definitely think he feels more comfortable exploring the possibilities of that, um, you know, um, I think there's maybe one more question, and I, I also have to kind of go to my next thing too fairly soon. Would I, um... Yeah, uh, I know Anne had a question. Maybe we can like just do it quickly, wrap up with that, or okay, great. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, sure. I think the, 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 what I wrote in the chat was not a question, it was a very random remark that I addressed to everybody. Um, uh, I, I, my, my question is to some degree already been addressed. Um, it was actually about how you, you mentioned how sort of anti-hegemonic masculinity um, is, is implicated in the hegemonic masculinities that you're describing and how it can sort of provoke it. Um, and you've talked a little bit more about how they're related, but could you maybe go back and clarify that one more time? Because I missed where you were seeing that. How hegemonic masculinity and non-hegemonic masculinity are related? Yeah, and how I think you said that the non-hegemonic masculinity can almost be like provoke this hegemonic right. response. I mean, I think the confrontation with the violence of it, I think, um, I think, 
I have to think more about it. Um, but I think the confrontation, like for, for Father Sergius, it, it is the confrontation with Nicholas. Um, uh-huh. and the fact that Nicholas feels that it's okay to sleep with his, you know, fiance and sleep with various women and, and bully other men and, and be this toxic figure. Um, I think that gives uh, Father Sergius this sort of like horrifying, you know, portrayal of, of what it means to be like a dominant man in society and, and you know, I think then he's like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go to the monastery, (laughs) you know? I mean, I think that, and and I sort of have to think about some other examples a little more carefully, but I think that it is this, but you know, it's the same with, I think, after the ball where he sees the violence and he's like, that's what this is. I don't want this. I don't want to be this. And it's just constant like Tolstoy negation of like, I'm not that, I'm not that. Still figuring out what I am, but not that. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's just, it's interesting. I think Donna Orwin had a comment and I just want to maybe end with Donna. <laughs> Hi, Donna. Where can, I don't know if she can hear me. I don't know if she's still here. Donna, you're muted. Donna, you're muted. How's that? You okay. are not muted. Hi, Donna. Hi, hi, hi Annie. Oh, wonderful to see all the faces of, the, of my friends. Um, so there's one other man who you haven't mentioned in the story, and that's Tolstoy himself. It's a, it's a frame narrative, and it's, it, the story comes, is, is, is his, his and, and, and where he is, and uh, why he's walking by himself, and he's sort of, and, right? And he's, and he's walking on this completely plowed land. And I think that this story, among other things, and, and, then, and then on this land is Haji Murat, who is the, who is the, the thistle, the broken thistle. And I think that this story is a kind of wrap up of his meditation on war and why, why we have wars and on human nature, on the question of why it happens. And so these different masculinities fold into that, that large lifelong exploration and in some cases as in the case of Haji Murat he's an extremely attractive character so it's 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 complicated for Mm -hmm. Tolstoy as he asks himself this question yeah I think it's really interesting and I mean I think the thing we haven't talked about is um, the military and the sort of, you know, what it, what it means to be a soldier and, and that version of masculinity. And I think, you know, on the one hand, Tolstoy, I think, has incredible depictions of bravery and battlefields in these moments. But I, I also think that the structure of military as such was something that I'm not convinced he was entirely comfortable with. Um, and it didn't last in very long. So, you know, again, sort of to extrapolate the, the warrior from the, the structure and the system is so really interesting. But it also it's interesting to think of him wandering this field innocently of peace and quiet no, now. it's not peaceful, Annie. It's no. cloud. And he it's asks the question, you know, what is this about this, the, the aggre- aggressiveness yeah. of, of people that they would, you know, just completely yeah. plow this whole thing? I think that's... Well, and, and violence that is, I yeah. think, but, but not but not obvious, right? Not war, not conflict, not, but, but this kind of inherent, you know, that, okay, he's done with war. He's not gonna write about that right, right there and then, but it's still, even just in relations, like the power dynamics between people, that's a kind of violence. Seeing this sort of more subtle, everyday violence that's there is I think also really interesting. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much for thank all you. the wonderful thank you, Ani. comments. Thank you so much, Ani. Yeah, thanks. Okay. This was this was great. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, thank you to Julie. I, I hope she saw my comment. I really appreciated her comment as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. This thank was you just fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.